well, first off, thank you all so much for coming out. These conversations are really important um, as California citizens, so I'm just so glad that everyone made it and uh, taking part in this conversation. Um, my name is Claire Gonzalez. I'm a marine scientist and an officer on the board of directors of the Blue Latitudes Foundation. The Blue Latitudes Foundation is a 501c3 certified nonprofit organization whose mission is to elevate the traditional concept of ocean stewardship to integrate industry, government, and the environment. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk with you all a little bit about exploring Riggs Reef in California. Just beneath the surface, these structures foster complex and beautiful ecosystems. Sponges and coral are wrapped around every beam and cross beam, and countless fish make their homes here. Rockfish, Boccaccio, and even the California state fish, the Garibaldi, all live on California's offshore oil platforms. So, what happens when the oil dries up? Enter the engineering feat of a lifetime. How do you remove a structure the size of the Empire State Building from the seafloor? This is a process called decommissioning. And in decommissioning, the first thing that happens, first and foremost, is that the oil company is going to, co going to come in and cap the well. And that oil company is liable for the well in perpetuity. So that means no matter what happens to the structure um, or if the well has a leak or anything like that, the oil company is responsible for the well forever. The decommissioning of the structure, um, imagine the scaffolding on a building. The decommissioning of that structure um, is an entirely different beast. Um, it's a process that requires a lot of resources, man hours, um, it poses a risk to health and safety, and it can have a, a long-lasting environmental impact, which is um, especially when you consider what is living beneath the surface. So like this structure, a lot of California's oil rigs have been in the water since the 60s or around there. So over the last 50 or so years, they've been growing and fostering this, um, this environment, this marine habitat. Um, through traditional decommissioning practices, the, the entire structure is removed, uh, effectively killing this entire habitat. On the other hand, Riggs Reef provides an alternative to complete rig removal in which the platform is modified as opposed to completely removed. Um, and the concept is that the lower portion is allowed to remain in the water column to live on as an artificial reef. So let's see if I can do this little, oh, sweet. Um, so the concept is the oil company would come in and cap the well, like we mentioned, first and foremost, cap the well. Then they're gonna cut the structure around here, around 30 meters, which is about 90 feet so that uh, vessels, um, fishing vessels, or just other boats can pass over it safely. And then this lower portion right here um, would be allowed to just remain in the water column um, and continue fostering that marine habitat that we looked at in a couple previous slides. That's the basics of the Riggs Reef pathway. But how do we even, practically speaking, do something like that? <laughs> Well, thankfully, California actually has an existing law. Um, it was Assembly Bill 2503. Um, it was passed into law in 2010 by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it's known as the Marine Resources Legacy Act. The Marine Resources Legacy Act, what it does is it established the California Artificial Reef Program that essentially says that California can start doing rigs to reef if we'd like to. However, there are some issues with uh, the Marine Resources L Legacy Act and so California hasn't used it yet, and before we really used it, we would need to address those uh, issues with the bill and probably make amendments to the law. And this is really complex, um, and a lot of different government organizations are involved with it, and I'd be more than happy to get into the meat of it with you um, for the rest of the day. Just let me know. Also, uh, Rick's Reef is not perfect. There are there are a lot of pros and cons in the program that need to be weighed um, uh, in coordination with different regulators and stakeholders in order to establish a successful Riggs Reef pathway. And so what I want to do now is just go through some of the pros and cons of the program. So let's start with the cons, shall we? The first con I want to talk about is invasive species. Um, these guys right here are green crabs. It's an invasive species in California, and essentially what they uh, 
are as they were introduced and they can affect the shell fishing industry. Um, but, but essentially, invasive species are important because, because, um, because the, California, or the California oil rigs can foster this reef habitat. They can also create somewhat of a corridor that could, uh, that could spread invasive species along our coastline. However, it's also important to note that the rate at which invasive species would spread on oil rigs um, is no different than the rate at which they would spread on a natural reef. So that's a con invasive species. The next con is obstructed seafloor and the way that it limits access to other ocean resources. Especially up here in Santa Barbara, there is a teeming fishing community. Um, and I've even spoken with, um, a couple weeks ago, there was a panel for the World Business Organization Academy, and um, we talked a lot about this, how the oil rigs and even reefing them would present an obstacle to fisher, uh, fishing activities, fisher uh, operations. Um, so you can't really trawl there, and boats have to really make a wide berth around the oil rigs to avoid entangling their uh, materials and fishing rods and things like that. So that would be a con that um, really wouldn't be addressed through rigs to reef because, because you would still have a portion of the structure there, it can still be a threat. The next con is a lack of public understanding. And this is something that my organization faces a lot and I'm sure everyone here is pretty familiar with. California has a very tenuous and complex history with oil and gas. And especially if you're not familiar um, with or educated on the background of Riggs Reef and what it's trying to address and the benefits that it's trying to achieve, it's really easy to jump to conclusions. Specifically, my organization tries to address that by focusing on education and outreach and doing lots of events like this um, and trying to make the conversation as popular as we can. Lastly um, is in the Gulf of Mexico, they've been reefing platforms for over 30 years, and they've reefed anywhere between 500 and 600 oil platforms. However, in California, there's no precedence uh, for rigs to reef on our coast. Um, and so what we're faced with doing is establishing a system um, that sustainably decommissions these structures in a way that benefits California's environment, uh, economy, and coastal communities. Um, so. That is probably the biggest con that we're facing at the moment. Now let's talk a little bit about the pros. The, one of the most significant pros of the Riggs Reef program is the ecological benefits. Um, again, especially here in Santa Barbara, there's a lot of research that has been done on these oil rigs. Researchers have been looking at uh, life and specifically fish life on the oil rigs for since the 80s, I think, um, and really been documenting the ways that these structures can foster that can enhance fisheries. Um, again, if you want to talk about more of the benefits of enhanced fisheries through the oil rigs, let's chat later, because I love a lot of that science, quite a bit. We can nerd out. The other pro is that the, the way that they compensate for habitat loss. Near shore, um, there's a lot of potential pressures. Um, there's runoff, overfishing, pollution. Oil rigs present um, present a habitat, uh, especially of hard substrate, in areas that might not have existing hard substrate habitat or in areas where that hard straight habitat might be degrading. The third pro that I want to talk about is reducing pollution. Through traditional decommissioning practices, the structure uh, as we kind of addressed earlier, would just be completely removed and it would be taken on shore somewhere to dis dismantle and dispose of. Um, however, Riggs Reef really presents an opportunity for us to recycle those uh, materials by just allowing that to, to stay in the water and um, act as an artificial reef. Lastly is economic benefits. Through uh, Riggs to Reef, what happens is the oil company saves a large chunk of money. But a portion of that savings would be given back to the state of California in a, a few different ways. The general fund, um, I think if I'm remembering the law correctly, a, a portion would go to the county that's directly adjacent to the oil rig, so it would come to Santa Barbara County, and it would establish a fund called the California Endowment Fund. And um, just to put this in perspective, uh, I think there was a study in the early 2000s that said that if 23 of the oil platforms were decommissioned along the California coast through the Riggs Reef pathway. The oil company would save about a billion dollars. Of that billion dollars, 
uh, 650 to 850 million dollars would come to the state of California. So that's an economic benefit for sure. Okay. More broadly, this is more than about one platform or one reef. Uh, in fact, along California's coast, we have 27 offshore oil and gas platforms. What California's policymakers, um, scientists, and us as, as citizen stakeholders decide to do now is going to impact the California coast for years and years to come. So again, thank you so much for coming and taking part of this conversation. I was so glad to be able to be here with you. Um, and I think I have time for a couple questions. And if there's any questions that don't get addressed, I'm downstairs at a table for the rest of the day. Yeah. Any questions? So I have one. As they deteriorate after their dismantled, Will that, when it collapses, the final structure, will that, will the uh, sea life on it hold it to, their reef together so it is a sustainable structure? Yeah, that's a really good question, and there are a couple things. Um, oil platforms are made from something named galvan uh, called galvanized steel, and it's a really, really strong material, and that's why oil companies use it, is because it really needs very little maintenance. Um, so I think there was a study that said that if we don't maintain those structures anymore, right now there's things that the oil company does to kind of maintain it. If we don't do any more of that, we're looking at like three to four hundred, three hundred to four hundred years um, before it loses any structural integrity. The other um, thing that you mentioned is the coast, the, the sorry, the invertebrate communities along the pilings do help um, slow that degradation because they take all the oxygen um, out of the water around the pilings and the beams and cross beams. Um, it would actually push that a little bit further. So yeah, there's uh, there's a lot more that we need to learn about that, but it is interesting, fascinating what we've already learned. Do we have time for more? One more. What's, what's the biggest opposition to this? I think the so big. Can you the oh, sorry. oh, sorry. So the the question was, what is the biggest opposition to Riggs Reef? And I, I think um, probably the biggest opposition is that oil, uh, sorry, artificial reefs that we build through the Riggs Reef pathway are artificial and they're man-made and they're not supposed to be in the ocean. Um, or they're you know, hypothetically, we should be returning the uh, ocean environment to its natural state. Um, so that's probably the biggest opposition is that this would not be returning the ocean to its natural state. Here for Claire. All right, well, thank you. So our next speaker is Frank Stapleman. He is with Bardex. Uh, it's going to be talking about wave energy. What I love about his uh, is, is uh, this is where his, his inspiration came from, which I think he'll talk about. Yep. So please join me in welcoming Frank Stapleman. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, a little about me, I moved here in 1979 and um, worked for a local tugboat company called Casanola Tug and then went on to work for uh, offshore tanker service and Kenny Elms had an office second story in the Marine Center over here. Um, the same office that Bardex started in 60 years ago. Bardex is a local company, uh, design and engineering in uh, mechanical hydraulic systems, some of the biggest stuff in the world. Uh, they've got uh, really international expertise out there. Uh, I hired on just as a technical writer, but I've got a marine engineering background, and um, oh, about four years ago I had this idea. And um, Bardex is... Um, uh, in step with me, we now have uh, U.S. Internet and international patent. And a year ago, Tom Miller, um, president and CEO, who's a gaucho, and we do have Mustang engineers up there <laughs> from you, from Cal Poly. Um, uh, but Tom came to you and goes, Frank, what are you going to call this thing? What, how are you going to brand it? Right? So I figured... Gee, you know, there, I know there are electric eels in the world, but this thing really looks like a ray, and you'll see that here in a little uh, bit. So I, you know, searched electric ray, and Torpedo Californica. We have our own species of electric rays out here uh, called, common name, Pacific Electric Ray, so this is what we're going to call it. Lived to 24 years of age, 40 pounds in weight. Um, they eat halibut. At, their own, at will, and squid, 
and has no known predators, including those juvenile white sharks that come along and eat all the other states in the coastline. And, gee, I wonder why. <laughs> right? So, um, Bard X is Electric Ray. Um, again, a 60 year old company, um, Mr. Bartlett passed on and left us with an employee stock option company. Um, they're really good at first of kind design and engineering. And they do it over and over again. Um, this device here is for an American client. They said, gee, we want this. And that's okay, fine. Well, Bardix engineered the whole thing. Um, it's called an SCR system, steel catenary riser. The mountains out here, double them in size. That's about 7,000 feet. This thing will pull up steel pipelines out of 7,000 feet of water in any direction, at any angle. 1,250 tons of brute strength and then the ability to place the ball socket at the end of this pipeline in a specific porch and it's going to rotate about there in 20 years. So brute strength and absolute subtle finesse. I thought, God, this is, you know, I have this idea, these guys can build it. We'll start with the top right. Like I said, uh, well, there's, a, there's a story. <laughs> um, moved here in 79. Uh, sailed from Hawaii here, uh, and we had January frequency of gale coming across the North Pacific in October. Um, and that was the easy part of it. Um, when the whole pressure system pulled back north, they left us lower right hand corner with a big northwest swell. So big that we couldn't keep the vessel stable. We're dragging a sea anchor off the port quarter. And we were still going to make that yellow course and come into Santa Barbara. But then the backwash bounced off a big surf. And 170 nautical miles at sea, we got a backwash half the size of the swell coming out of the northwest. We changed the uh, drogue to the starboard quarter and headed to Mexico and beyond. The wind gave up and we made it in. It was OK, and I get to tell you the story. Um, Went with one of Kenny Elm's boat, offshore tanker service, to Alaska. This is Upper Cook Inlet. Uh, worked up there for 12 years. Uh, I am not on the ice. I would never do that. And the chief engineer who built that uh, photo said, gee, I could put a polar bear in this. I can, you know, Photoshop that in. And apparently he decided not to do that. She was not part of the crew. Um, 2,500 square miles of ice moving at five knots. So Cook Inlet is 50% larger than Santa Barbara Channel. Used to fill with ice in the wintertime. And I used polar Arctic tidal rotation patterns there and was moving the vessel around when the other vessels wouldn't go. Um, my last offshore job was this, again, Cook Inlet. Uh, 4,000 tons, first of kind float off installation. We went into high tide and 15 minutes later the thing was set in the bottom because the tide changes so fast. 32 feet in six hours. So a little bit of expertise, practical equipment that I do things, if you do it just right, are seem extraordinary. Um, so I'm retired master oceans, unlimited tonnage, ships pilot, for Port Wainimi and Cook Inlet. And I'm a practical naval architect and marine engineer. The vessel on the left, that motor sailor's composite wood epoxy, surfs without a spinnaker. The vessel on the right is steel, about the same displacement, 12 tons, but I don't want it to surf because I'm using a mechanical self steering vane that likes a stable wind condition. And on the foredeck is what I use to anchor with and stabilize the boat. That's a nose-weighted diving paravane. And that was my inspiration for the electric ray. What you see there on the left is the test model that I built. And we ran a test uh, off of Goleta Pier in April. We had a great day. 
East uh, Channel buoy had mixed long period swell. You can see one hitting the beach there. Five feet and six seconds. Wind chopped out in the channel. This is after the test. The wind picked up, created all kinds of wind driven current. Uh, it was a really great day for a function test. Um, the paired main is neutral buoyant. Operates just subsurface, and you'll see that here shortly. And the waves push it down and push it up, but at the same time, it's neutral to all surge currents. This is the boat landing underneath Galita Pier on the east side. On the right, that square is the surface float. There, you see the paravane subsurface about six inches. And the waves are coming from the right. Why is it looking to the left? There's more current coming from the east than the wave current is coming from the west now. And you'll see that change here as this video goes along. Um, of course, there's surge coming off the pilings, all that kind of stuff. The near pole is the paravane, the far pole is the surface float, and you'll see that the two are tracking together. So the neutral buoyant paravane is moving just subsurface up and down with the wave pattern. And it dips and bobs a little further one way or another, but over an hour and a half period, constantly re regained that, that neutral buoyant position. Now, if you were in a little boat ready to get launched in this, would this be any fun? Would you get tossed about a bit? The problem with a buoyant object on the water is you get thrown up and you fall down, and the paravane does not get, does not fall down, it's pushed down. And you'll see in a minute here, a couple of seconds, and you'll hear it, how quiet and not as frantic subsurface. Of course, the camera's too close and all that kind of stuff, so there's only uh, so much you, you see in this, but this is the function test. Now the paravane is facing towards the west. We have all this wind-driven current where previously it was 180 degrees out. Again, neutral buoyant, hydrodynamic uh, stable, constantly tracking below the surface. Okay, so here's the wave energy converter using a depth adjustable paravane. That's the patent name. 94 meters tall. The particles you see are, indicate the ocean current, which is 90 degrees to the wave pattern. The scale on the left is instant, instantaneous energy harvest. It's not the power that's put out. This is a 13 meter uh, by 18 second swell. Paraffin is 1,100 square meters in area, about 12,000 square feet. Um, capacity is somewhere in the 5.25, maybe 5.5 megawatts. Uh, the, most of the wind turbines you see in the state are 2 to 3 megawatts. Retract the operating range and you can operate in any condition. This is a graphic. Um, Coastal current, the thing aligns with it. If you stand on the beach, the green arrows down there is what you feel around your ankles when a wave comes in. Uh, and it, it, here in that video, you could see the, the paravane pitching and yawing. In the functional test, I didn't control the motion. It ran the full wave height. When you hydraulically slow up and reach one half the wave height, and that's what that red line is down there, you get prime energy production. And that's it. That simple. Um, not the greatest wave power in the Pacific. You can see it gets much uh, more north. This is produced by NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratories. Uh, Jimmy Carter created that back when he was president. Uh, been gone by a different name. They do wind power and solar power throughout the US. 
This is more than a pretty picture. If you click on one of the little bins, those square boxes there, where we have the blow up in the top right corner, you get all this engineering data out in different formats of how much energy there is and on and on and on. Um, of course, I could stand one of my 94 meter tall uh, pair of veins on top of uh, Hildago Harvest uh, or Hermosa. They're out 600 feet of water. So great repurpose of the rigs, coming back to what we're here for today, right? Um, this nautical chart, um, you know, there are, are pipelines and cables coming ashore that can be utilized. It's more than just the structure. Um, if you don't know it, uh, top box up there, that area um, off uh, Point Pedernales, just above Arguello, was where PG&E had a wave energy uh, project going for a while. They had one up off of Humboldt. Neither worked, uh, went through. Uh, one mechanically up north, they had a, a, a product that failed, and down south, a regulatory, uh, too much of a regulatory hurdle. Um, Again, Harvest, Hermosa, and Hildago, great locations. Um, if you don't know the term greenfield development, if you have a green field and you build a factory on it, that's greenfield development. If you have an existing factory and you go and repurpose it, that's brownfield development. One minute. One minute? Yeah. You're going to talk faster? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, currents. Waves, piles of stuff, a whole bunch of those paravanes up there, 46 megawatts. How and where does this power get stored? Pump water storage. If you desalinate water during the nighttime when no one needs the energy, you get to pump that ashore up in a reservoir and spin a turbine during the daytime when you need it. You can get the Central Valley uh, re-irrigated uh, or put it into the state pipeline. We've gone over the five attributes here, well, four of them, the least weight of generated power. Each one of these components floats. You don't need a heavy lift ship to install it. You can flow it out and winch it to the bottom. Um, the first International Pollution Convention convened in New York City in 1898. Delegates from Europe flew into New York City, and they couldn't solve the problem. Six years later, the first Model T was sold. Twelve years later, the big three existed. <coughs> it was consumers who changed the 19th century pollution problem. What will your choice be for your children and their friends? And we don't have the time. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd show you the electric ray again, the big blue dip, but that's what's coming next. Thank you for your time. Uh, next up, we have uh, Bob Evans with La Mer Blue Productions. Uh, Bob, good friend of the Maritime Museum. We did a, a, a Bob's uh, uh, spent seven years photo uh, documenting the marine life on the oil platforms from 1974 to 1981. Uh, talk, uh, we did a, a photography exhibit of his work, Marine Megatropolis. It is actually the Maritime Museum's first um, uh, traveling uh, 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 exhibit and has been shown also at the Channel Islands Maritime Museum. And Bob has a plethora of ideas for these platforms, correct? Yes. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Bob Evans. Hey. Good evening or good afternoon. Um, I'm very fortunate that four years ago uh, with Emily and Greg and Suzanne Chess, my partner, we suggested to the Maritime Museum I had all these photographs of, of seven years of 850 log dives, basically looking at the platforms for, as an industrialist, what could they possibly be used for while they were in production. So uh, I had a great uh, team of people. There, there I am 30 years ago on Platform Hilda. That's my former partner, Andy McMullen, uh, John Hodges, Erica, and we went out on a boat, we had to have a tender, we had to have all sorts of uh, operations. Dr. Hester was our scientist. I worked with a lot of Scripps Institute people. Shane and Jenny Anderson are big support with this exhibit. Uh, Linda Palmer 
And John Herring, when we came out here uh, back in the 70s, they, we weren't allowed to dive on the platforms. So we approached John Herring, the foreman manager. Linda, at that time, was the first woman engineer out here on the platforms. They actually had to put doors on the bathrooms for her. Uh, and she was very supportive of all our projects. This platform hill is no longer here, but we logged hundreds of dives on this particular platform off of uh, uh, Carpinteria. Okay, this is what the platform looked like, this platform hill. All this ended up going to the, uh, to the Long Beach dump. I talked to one of the commercial divers that was involved in decommissioning a platform. He says, Bob, it was terrible. Millions and millions and millions of crabs and octopus, everything went, uh, was torn up off the seabed floor. Now, this is the kind of stuff that went to the dump. So you have a baby of the nudibranch. That's the size of a dime. You have a decorator crab that takes a sponge. It's a great story. You can spend thousands of hours talking about photos of mine. You'd be falling asleep. This is a platform, Hilda, where we started doing a lot of our personal research with our, my money uh, that I made through selling my underwater photographs for 30 years. Uh, here we are documenting the first utilizing starfish as a biological control because at the time the oil industry was scraping off the mussels and said, this is crazy. Uh, why don't we utilize the starfish to control, and that's could talk to hours about this project. No one's really knows our study about this. It's an amazing story what we did. So we designed up our own camera systems. At that time, you didn't have GoPro cameras. You didn't have half the stuff. So this was, uh, you can notice it goes from the sunlight during the day to nighttime, it gets dark. And I have 8,000 feet of film in Los Angeles in storage, in a storage facility that someday I'd like to get transferred. It's only three minutes of some of the stuff that we have that we filmed. It's eight millimeter, but with today's quality, digital quality, we can, um, we can transfer. So you can, a lot of interaction going on here. Milton Love, Dr. Milton Love at UCSB is a very good friend of mine. And, uh, this would be great for his students to look over and see what's going on. Okay, let's move on. Uh, being our research, most of the research that we did was provided almost 95% out of my pocket. But ExxonMobil uh, con we, uh, contacted us, heard about what we were doing, said, hey, we're putting a new platform at 850 feet of water. We want you to document the life as it formed on the platform. So for three years, we went out throughout the period of years. We put camera mounts on the platform. Here Andy is down at 120 feet of water filming uh, the rockfish that are baby rockfish that are at that depth. And that we'd find the baby rockfish to 100 feet, and then we never went down to 600 feet. But Milton Love has gone down to submarines, and there are very large, millions, millions, don't kid yourself, millions of fish living below these, these structures. So uh, the mussels on the platforms, as Jeff, we call, my wife says they're the, like the kidneys of our channel. So as the water flows past this platform, millions of mussels are filtering our water on a daily basis, cleaning our channel. So the last thing we want to do is uh, remove the kidneys out of our ocean. So we looked at all these mussels and we thought, you know, this, we should turn this into a business. And at the time we found out this, uh, California, you couldn't harvest mussels for human consumption. You can only do it for bait. So we were able in five years, the Department of Health and the Department of Fish and Game to overturn those laws in the state of California, and we were out the first to commercially harvest mussels off these platforms. It's a viable business. So if we were starving in Santa Barbara and the North got cut off and the South got cut off, our commercial fishermen could go out here in the channel and they could provide the food. This is just a small amount of the mussels on these platforms. It's just... It's a massive amount. So here's Rick Williams of the Muscle Company. We formed a company, and there's our mussels. And we went down to a cannery in Oxnard, and we canned a lot of mussels. I have one right here if someone wants to try it. <laughs> Can <laughs> two, three, one. I have garlic in it. I have no idea. But it's not swelling, so it's okay, right? <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a $44,000 can of mussels here. Uh, but uh, now the Chumash, uh, my mom worked for Dr. Rosera at LA, LA County Museum on the Chumash, so I had spent a lot of time on San Miguel. And look, what were the Chumash Indians eating for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years? Mussels and abalone and barnacles. So that's all 
mussel shells. So that actually, the people that were here before us, the Indians were uh, really making, okay, here's Platform Hill, that's what's left of what the, when the platform got decommissioned. That's basically the blues, about 100 feet of water. The mussel mound, the red area, is the mussels that had fallen down from the platform that had been dropped from the, uh, from the surface. So that's another man-made midden mound. Uh, this is Platform Holly that's up for decommissioning right now, which makes this whole issue very topical. And that's at 150 feet on a platform, 120 feet on Platform Holly. Baby Boccaccio fish, you go down deeper, you see the bigger ones. Uh, and there's always a question with a platform, do they rob from the natural reefs? No, they don't. And I have thousands of pictures documenting all sorts of stuff that gets, so that's a male cabazon guarding the eggs and we put them underneath the microscope and those little black dots are the big eyes from the cabazon. That cabazon there is a size smaller than a dime and that one over there next to Hillary Hauser, Heal the Ocean, you can get the idea how big it gets. So they live on the rig, they're all over the place and eventually they skedaddle out of town and they go someplace else. This was the first recorded aquaculture program on Platform Holly. And, oh, thank you, honey. And it ended up in a, a two-page spread. Boy, I sure like getting this check, I'll tell you. National Geographic two-page spread on the first intercontinental shelf. And here you can see all the fish, Boccaccio, juvenile fish below Platform Holly. This I documented, I could spend several hours on all the aquaculture programs that my fans were involved in and I had the opportunity to photograph all of them. So we could spend two or three hours just on this idea of, of all the things that my friends did. This is Wynn Swin, he's no longer with us. I have all the photographs. He allowed me, he says, Bob, I want you to document everything I do and never share it. Well, <laughs> sorry Wynn, I think it's okay now. Uh, this is in Japan, to give you an idea, the Japanese are way ahead of utilizing structures in the ocean for farming. This was uh, almost 40 years ago. Who knows what they're up to now? I mean, uh, it's, it's huge, just where it goes. So this is one of the reefs off Japan, same thing, fish. This platform holly, this is what we're looking at, the underneath part that uh, they're, uh, we're going to plug the wells, that's happening, and clean up all that oil stuff, so the question is, does it remain in place or do we cut it off at 80 feet of water? This is what the bottom looks like out. This is what the bottom's going to look like after that platform's been removed. It's basically taking out a 50-year community. These are some of my ideas of possibilities of my granddaughter had to get involved in putting the little fish <laughs> habitats in the little <laughs> crab homes. Grandma. the bottom of the platform. I mean, there's so much life down there. Why not add to it? So we could put little structures for crabs and things like that. Uh, another thing is we could just leave it like they have off Galita as a bird habitat hatchery. The pelicans can sit up there. And this is a food supply, that, again, below Platform Holly. There are a lot of fish down there. Uh, the other idea that I think will sit, sit well with everybody in our community is take it off the horizon cut it down to 80 feet of water, leave the lower part of the structure. But I say we should be responsible for all the intertidal area. So my idea was cut it off at 80 feet, put a big giant tarp net across the top of it, big holes in, through it in case divers get on, underneath it, they can come up through it uh, as escapes like they do on, on ships. And this is what it would look like. All the mussels, so we would take commercial divers here in town, we carefully push those mussels off, let them drop down to this big steel tarpon, and this is what the, the, that would look like. And this is what it would look like at 80 feet. There'd be your reef, and it'd be all your fish swimming up above the reef. They only go up so high. Um, let's see. This is another idea. People are talking about kelp. This is on Platform Holly, where I actually ended up seeing different types of algaes growing on the platform. So it's cut off at 80 feet, UCSB could have the cameras and our son's one of the top professor oceanography in Seattle. He could have a research facility testing the salinity. He's in the, the salinity change in the ocean. Platform holly, algae's growing out there on the platform. So if you provided substrates for the algae, you could have it. 
What's another idea? I'm into ROVs, so that's another part of my life and company. But you could have remote ocean vehicles. Someone could be sitting at home instead of watching the stuff we have to watch on television. They could be harvesting. Get the kid off the cell phone and say, hey, log on, kid. You got to go harvest some scallops at 600 feet on, on Hondo's platform. Oh, yeah. Get them off the games. We got it. We got it. Yeah, that's a better game. That's a money making game. You know, it's like picking cotton down. So this, this is, uh, you know, everyone's talking wind farm. The problem with the wind is, is, as you know, there's somebody we don't like to talk about too much, but he says, when the wind stops, what do you do, you know? That's when the babies get made. So uh, <laughs> the wind stops, what do you do? You, you have to store it. When it's ready, you've got to store it someplace. I found out Platform Holly has a 16,000 volt cable going out to it. I'm not an electrician, but I asked an engineering firm, they go, Bob, that is a lot of electricity, 16,000 volts. Think what we could do with that. So I started thinking about saltwater batteries. There's tons of information online about so 4,000 years ago, they were making saltwater batteries. Look up the Baghdad battery. And so I thought, you know, in the ocean, problem on land is real estate. And in the ocean, you've got a, a vertical space. You've got a lot of space to do a lot of great things. So I thought, well, platforms cut off. Well, when the sun shines, we'll send the power out to our, 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 our storage facility on the bottom of the ocean. And then when the, night, the sun stops, the wind stops, we can pull off that storage. Then, with the power going out to the platform, we can also create more artificial reefs. And it's called secrete. And you put an electrical charge on some wires. Next thing, it starts to build up like a shell does in the ocean. So, uh, and this is, that's, I'm almost done, Hunter. Okay. And this is uh, for the, okay, uh, and with the interesting in the sea farming, they have to contain the fish. On the platforms, you don't have to contain them. You don't have to get them antibiotics and all that kind of stuff. So this was another thing of, this is a wave energy idea that with pistons and the going up and down, just very similar to this gentleman's great idea, up and down, up and down. And the power of the cable can go in shore, we can grow kelp on it and all that other stuff. This was another form close to the surface so you could have people could surf on it. It would be an outrageous surf spot like Rhodes <laughs> Reef. Uh, this was another kind of cool idea of using a mattress. So when uh, you don't have any wave action, you can let the air out of it. We can reutilize those oil lines and put pump air out into this mattress. And we can blow it up. And we can create a form that we want for the best kind of surf. And it goes up and down, too, just like the waves do, and provides power. And this is my last slide. I don't think anyone wants to have a hotel out there, especially next to Holly, with all that natural gas bubbling up out of the ground. But some of the other platforms might be nice, the tourist location. But you're going to have to charge a lot of money for those rooms, because to maintain a platform is it's nobody's business. It is ex it's in the millions of dollars. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much. But right now we have Mark Drawbridge. So Mark is with Hub SeaWorld Research Institute and uh, California Aquaculture Association. He'll be talking about uh, uh, in, on behalf of both organizations about marine protein production. Right? You got it. Yeah. Please join me in welcoming Mark. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it, um, and, and love that last talk. I would love to hear more about some of the aquaculture pieces. Um, and the history there, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. Um, so as Greg mentioned, my name is Mark Drawbridge. I'm a senior research scientist at Hub Sea World Research Institute. Uh, our institute is a 501c3 nonprofit that was founded in 1963 by the same folks that founded Sea World in 1964. So we have a long history. Uh, I've been at the institute for 30 years um, and working primarily in aquaculture. Uh, as Greg mentioned, I'm also representing the California Aquaculture Association. I'm a board member there and past president. So particularly the folks uh, within that association, and there's some folks here in Santa Barbara uh, that are members of that organization that are growing things uh, in the ocean for human consumption or other purposes. So uh, again, that's primarily what I'm going to be talking about. So uh, to start off with, I just want to kind of give you an overview of the need and what we believe the need is uh, in terms of seafood production. And so a lot of people uh, don't really realize this. If you look at this graphic down here, um, this shows you in orange capture fishery production. It goes back to 
it's a little bit blurry here, but I think that's 1990, and it goes into the future. So somewhere around here is present day. So as you can see, capture fisheries globally have been flatlined. Um, the oceans have been putting out as much as they can. Um, and that's been our traditional source of seafood production uh, looking back in time. And so uh, commercial fishermen, like aquaculture folks and agriculture folks, are trying to figure out uh, ways to produce more food for more people sustainably. So we all have that same responsibility. But again, looking forward in terms of seafood production and where that seafood production is going to have to come from, it's really going to have to be come, uh, come from farming. And so we, you see some of the statistics here, and that's just to meet up with uh, uh, human population growth. Uh, another thing that people don't realize is how much seafood we import into this country. So it's over 90% uh, of what we eat is imported. And over 50% of that is farmed. So again, it's coming in. It's coming in from other places. So if you look at that in terms of the seafood security and seafood safety, we believe as an association, this is really an important thing to be focused on. If you can grow it here, obviously you have to grow it responsibly and sustainably. But you know where it came from. You know how it's been grown. Uh, and and uh, as well as put, putting people to work and the economic aspects of it. Uh, in terms of the imports and the economic uh, impact of that, it's over $18 billion uh, in imports. And if you subtract out the exports, you're left with about $13 billion to the overall trade deficit here in the US. So it's a big number. Uh, and then uh, on top of human population growth, the health organizations are telling us we should double our seafood consumption because it's good for you. So that's going to be another factor that comes into play. As far as the potential goes, again, uh, pretty, some pretty interesting statistics here. These are the top 13 aquaculture producers worldwide, and this legend matches up with this graphic here. So here's the United States, um, pretty minuscule overall aquaculture production here in terms of uh, volume. The amount of land area that we have available is very considerable, but look at all this ocean uh, and water area here that's un uh, underutilized. Um, so the potential is quite large as a nation. Uh, and here's some additional kind of statistics that link back to the last slide I showed you. So huge potential. California as a food producing state uh, on land, we're number one when it comes to agriculture. So and you can see uh, it's big business. Uh, it's employing a lot of people. There's a lot of farms. Where does aquaculture fit into that? It's really relatively a small, small player. So we need to bump this up in its importance, especially given the fact uh, uh, how much ocean uh, resources there are available. There's, you know, the Earth's covered with 70% water, yet less than 2% of our food comes from uh, that, those sources. So, and the ocean's a great thing because, uh, as you all know, freshwater is becoming pretty limited, uh, whereas we have uh, quite a bit of ocean to, to work with. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here, but this is kind of interesting information to look at, too. So, uh, you know, where does most of our seafood come from? these days, and this looks at then at commercial fisheries. So you can see I've kind of highlighted Southern California here. Um, San Diego, I'm from San Diego, so not originally, but uh, these days, and th that's, that's uh, pretty low when you compare it to Los Angeles and Santa Barbara. Uh, so again, these are the color coded down here. These are mollusks uh, in yellow here, and that's primarily squid. Uh, the fish, and, and I'm gonna be focused quite a bit on fish, because that's really where our, most of our research is focused. Um, you can see is in blue here, and in fact, most of this is at like anchovy uh, catches, so not something that you know most Americans readily uh, consume. Uh, and again, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but it is kind of interesting uh, breaking out the top 15 uh, 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 types of uh, critters that are landed. Uh, this is by value here, so you can see lobster, high value uh, prawns, so a lot of invertebrates here. Uh, and one of the reasons I put this together is to kind of um, look at some of the culturable fish. Uh, market squid dominates both these categories, so it's actually not part of this just because it would dwarf all these other categories, but you can see that information here. Uh, we've been working on a research basis, culturing, and I'll sh show more of this, uh, California yellowtail, white sea bass, and California halibut are three of the species that we're working on. So um, I've highlighted some of that, certainly to try and get them in the mix if they're not already there. Uh, sea bass is here, halibut's here, so you can see just under a million dollars in value. And again, I don't have a lot of time, so I, I pulled out and just looked at the fish, and again, this is to kind of show you what fish come in by value and volume. And, and these are fish that, uh, sable fish is actually being farmed up in the northwest, but these are fish that are not going to be farmed. So 
Um, but there are some uh, suitable candidate species in here that are mixed in. And again, just to kind of give you an idea of what's being brought in by uh, volume and value in Southern California. Uh, as far as what seafood to farm, uh, this is from NOAA Fisheries, so this is, and this is for the, uh, marine fish within the nation. So you can see uh, it's pretty much dominated by things that we all love to eat, uh, you know, the shellfish, clams, oysters, and mussels. Uh, salmon representing really uh, the, the main marine fish, uh, at least to this point, and shrimp is also uh, farmed quite a bit. A couple things that are missing from this, uh, I put some pictures in over here, uh, kelp, macroalgae, uh, a lot of interest in this, and uh, I understand there's some of that being grown right off the coast here now, which is awesome. Uh, and then some of the fin fish that we're working on. Uh, as far as where to for, uh, farm it, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of work being done, including here at UCSB, which is great, looking at marine spatial planning, uh, plugging in some different factors on uh, things like mooring depths if you're going to uh, try and site a farm. So um, there's a lot of good information being brought forward relative to where good spots would be to actually try and do this, where you're, where you're minimizing uh, user conflicts and, and those sorts of things. So right now, at least with this chart, uh, the emphasis is in federal waters here, and I'm just using this for illustrative purposes, but um, at least for fin fish right now, there's no, there, there's, there's no legal pathway to get permission to farm fin fish in state waters. You can do it in federal waters, but even that process is pretty convoluted. So. Uh, nobody's really doing that here in the, in the uh, mainland U.S. Uh, how to farm, I'll just skip through this pretty briefly, just to give you an overview of techniques that are used uh, around the world. Um, for the purposes of offshore farming, you're going to be looking at something like this uh, here, long lines uh, in the water here. This is uh, probably from uh, overseas in China or Japan. One of the things I wanted to point out down here, and this is from the FAO, you can see the, the growth, the surge in growth of production of, in this case, uh, kelp. So this is wild capture down here in the dark green, and this is the growth in production. Um, so that's, that's uh, pretty phenomenal. And we're just, we're just, really the United States is just getting on board now. Uh, as far as shellfish and mussels, similar technique here, and again, you guys have some of this right off the coast here, which is awesome. Um, so you can see here, the production's kind of, at least with this example for this mussel, is pretty static. Uh, fin fish, this is an example of European sea bass. So this is probably over in the Mediterranean here. This is probably an Asian country here. Uh, and I'll talk more about this as far as what might be appropriate um, here in the United States. Again, this is pretty close to shore, not something that's going to happen uh, in the U.S. very likely for a number of different reasons. Uh, and again, this is just an example. Uh, and you can see some of the production here. Um, hatchery production was actually started in the early 70s, and then you can see it, it's really taken off there. And, and again, this is in the category of fishes that are imported into the United States that we're purchasing and eating. Uh, another type of uh, farming activity that's taken on uh, some traction and some interest, it's called integrated multitrophic aquaculture. And here, uh, what, what is being done, and I think this is up in Canada, you have the, uh, fish here. And that's fed aquaculture. Obviously, these fish are being fed. Um, and then you have nutrients coming off the fish. And the particulates are being picked up by, in this case, strings of mussels. And the dissolved uh, inorganic nutrients are being picked up by macroalgae. So the, you're, you're utilizing uh, the, the, the food inputs and the nutrients as they flow through this. Uh, so, and you're also getting multiple crops. So we're actually in the process of doing a land-based research project uh, looking at this, which is going to be really interesting. So just to give you an idea of our experience, and again, if you come down and visit with me, I'll be happy to answer questions and talk to you in a little bit more detail. Um, but these are the species that we've been actively working on for the last 30, 35 years, white sea bass um, and halibut these days is primarily for stock replenishment, trying to bring the stocks back up because they've been depleted. Yellowtail we're very interested in as a food fish. Um, and this, these X's just kind of are check boxes uh, indicating that f we've spawned these fish in the case of these three species. We've done the hatchery work, the fingerling production, grow out, and then test marketing of the fish. So again, these aren't being produced commercially. It's all been R&D. Uh, the reason this is a red X here is because flatfish really aren't well suited for cage uh, um, production. The cages kind of move and it rubs their belly, so they're better suited for tanks. Um, again, we've done that and we've done some test marketing. Again, that's providing it to local restaurants and so forth and getting their feedback. 
Uh, with striped bass, striped bass is a fish that's been uh, spawned here in California and reared for many years. They used to release them up in the Bay Area. Uh, that was uh, curtailed in the early 2000s. But we have looked at that and done uh, these steps here as well. As far as scales of production, again, we do a lot of research, R&D, developing. Really what we're interested in doing is learning how to grow these things and, and learning how to grow them uh, in a sustainable manner. So looking at developing sustainable feeds and so forth, we've worked on various scales, small scale R&D, uh, working with students and so forth. Uh, we have a full scale uh, hatchery in Carlsbad. If you're ever in the area, uh, please come by and, and visit with us. But again, you can see different, uh, here we're handling brood stock and we've got juveniles and We've done ocean grow out. This is uh, Catalina Island, so we maintain some cages that are permitted for white sea bass for where we do uh, uh, for release purposes. So these are sea bass in those cages. We work with commercial fishermen uh, to move fish around and help us with nets. And these are two projects that we did down in Mexico. So you can't get permits to do large scale testing um, here in California or federal waters. So uh, we did some testing of cage design. So this is a submersible cage you can put um, below any kind of surface swell or out of eyesight, depending on what your objectives are, and rear fish in there. Uh, this is more of a traditional surface cage. So again, we're just testing different cage designs, what it takes to operate them, how the fish perform, different, how different species perform. Okay, now linking this finally to why we're here. Um, oil production platforms is a base for seafood production. So the main thing here is this would offer you is significant infrastructure support. So typically, if you're going to do this uh, and where it's being done elsewhere, you, you're going to move, want to move offshore for these reasons here. Uh, this is the, the, the thing that you want to do. Uh, and absent this, you're just kind of out there and you would have to have a service boat or something out there to maintain your people, maintain security, and do these types of services. So having a platform out there uh, would allow you, um, you know, that infrastructure. In addition, you could do some uh, hatchery production on the platform. Uh, so it would represent some unique opportunities. And uh, it was almost 20 years ago, we actually explored this uh, in some detail uh, for a specific platform, Platform Grace. And so I'll share with you just uh, a few slides from that. Um, we looked at it, looking at the feasibility, what could it bring? Uh, and that particular platform at the time wasn't producing oil, but they were still maintaining kind of the platform and its base of operation. Uh, in support of an adjacent platform. So it had a working gener generator, so there was power, um, there was available deck space, uh, th and there was a seawater supply or potential seawater supply in the form of um, fire suppression units here. So other infrastructure here, living quarters, again, all very nice things uh, that you wouldn't ordinarily have. Uh, we did a simple deck layout. Uh, we had about 10,000 square feet we were kind of playing around with as a potential. Um, the rest of it was being utilized, but our ideas were potentially halibut production, al abalone production. You have larval and live feeds, experimental capabilities, brood stock here, juveniles uh, that could be reared out and put out into cages. Uh, these could be grown to food size here. And again, I'm, I'm emphasizing the food production piece here, but again, these same uh, critters, especially in the case of abalone, could be used for outplanting to help bring the populations back up. Uh, this is a little bit uh, uh, somewhat repetitive, but again, the structure offering housing, food storage, some of these um, nice attributes here. Shared synergies, uh, depending on what is going on in adjacent uh, platforms. This is a prototype that we did, recognizing we had uh, we were going to have sm really relatively small footprint on the platform. Uh, a rack system for halibut, so these are all baby halibut in here, um, and trying to take advantage of the three-dimensional nature of these rack systems. So I have to wrap it up. This is a, a, a graphic on, a, on the NOAA website you can look at. Uh, here's an oil platform over here. They don't have anything actually growing off of it, but you can see some other stuff going on. And uh, the main thing here is, again, if you're in a protected area, which is likely not going to happen, uh, it's very limited in the U.S. for a number of different reasons. As you move offshore, you have to deal with uh, more and more weather conditions, which you can do um, with surface cages, but ultimately you may have to go with submersible cages. And I think that's all I have. And like I said, I'll be downstairs, happy to answer any questions if you want to pop by and visit. Thank you so much. Please join me in welcoming Ocean Foresters. Good evening, everyone. Um, we are Ocean Foresters.
located in Ventura, interested in solving some of the problems that you'll hear from us, what we are doing, but specifically what we are going to talk about is about the platforms that are now being obsolete and how we can come up with a solution that would be useful for the future of uh, removing the platform or not and what kind of situation we can have. What ocean foresters are, um, by the way, I'm here, I'm Mohammed Hassan, Mark Capron, we're engineers and we have uh, developed with our, uh, something called ARPA-E, which is Federal Government Grant for Advanced Research that we did for uh, coming up with a system of growing uh, algae first. It was started with that, but we have come to that situation that we can grow much more fin fish, or different types of fish, uh, and, and that would be more helpful. That's what we have come up with, and Mark will give you the details. So in essence, you have heard many interesting presentations today, and they were all very good. Now we are going to add a few more things for you to consider, for others to consider, because there's always alternatives that can be utilized for the, for the future. This is it's coming, 27 of them, or something of that magnitude that uh, are platforms available. So we need to come up with uh, different things. Specifically, if there is ocean research that has to be done, if there is food production that has to be done, if there are other things that can be done, with the help of the platforms, and uh, I'll let Mark Capron go into this. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, so you notice we're talking about uh, restorative aquaculture ecosystems are a different way to do aquaculture. Essentially, uh, we have been doing aquaculture in uh, like one species at a time. And ARPA-E wanted, for example, us to do uh, macroalgae. And um, uh, I wanna give you a, a feel for where we're going. If you are doing agriculture, you own a bunch of land and you get to farm, uh, research farming on land you own in permanent research structures. Uh, if you happen to have a natural reef like uh, uh, these people in off of Baja, they got featured in National Geographic, you can manage the reef and uh, do very well. And that's what we're talking about with restorative aquaculture ecosystems. It's just that we're going to make the reef. Um, and the reason for this is because if you have uh, whatever creatures you've got, oops, um, they're all interacting. And you'll notice we have nutrients are coming into the system. And if you're harvesting the fin fish or the filter feeders or the plants or whatever, their nutrients are leaving the system. Might help to know that I have a wastewater engineering background, water resources recovery nowadays. Um, and so I'm big on the whole nutrient cycle thing. And the thing is, if you can get the nutrients optimized, you can actually, you know, these nutrients input here optimized, you can get a whole lot more productivity. And it's not just productivity, it's biodiversity. Okay, so talking about nutrient recycling, we have uh, this, of course, happening within the reef. And then on the outside here, if you're doing it right, um, whenever you are extracting nutrients from the system, you've got to put them back. You can't just extract them here and then put them all back at the end of the wastewater treatment plant in one little spot. That's what gives us problems. Okay, so specifically for um, Santa Barbara area, where we have sandy seafloors, I want to talk about a neat way to restore kelp forests. And this is a work by uh, Bob Keel. Um, he takes granite stakes, um, uh, injects them into the sandy seafloor. Um, kelp volunteer on the stake. You know, they just show up. You don't have to plant them or anything. Um, unfortunately, he, he found out, um, a, like a, a year later when he went back, that crabs were eating the kelp fast. And so he had to increment uh, the whole design with a um, octopus house on top of each stake. Um, and then this is a, uh, <clears throat> right, because the octopus will go eat the crabs so there's not too many crabs. And th that's a part of the whole ecosystem 
I'm talking about. Uh, and this is an aerial view of kelp actually reaching the surface from the stakes. You can see you put the stakes pretty tamely. Um, the other kind of thing you can do on your ecosystem is a, a living reef approach. And this is a guy we're connected with, uh, Niels Lindquist. He's actually on the East Coast and he does oysters. Uh, and he has this special material. Um, he calls them tufts, but it's, it's kind of a blend of concrete and uh, jute. And the uh, uh, juvenile, uh, not the juvenile, the super tiny oysters, I forget the proper name, spat maybe, um, will, will populate on this like crazy. You put them in a tank and the, they'll all flock to it and then they'll grow like crazy and this stuff um, slowly dissolves and you're left with the, the oysters. And it works. Uh, if you're an oyster farmer, I want to talk to you. But um, that's the other thing we can do for living reefs and you can do a similar kind of thing for mussels. Uh, and the reason this is all important for a uh, ecosystem approach to aquaculture and why we need a um, getting to a research outfit doing this, this research on ecosystem aquaculture is because of what happened in Northern California. Uh, they had a whole bunch of sea stars die, some kind of disease got them. Sea stars mm -hmm. eat sea urchins. The sea urchins population was starting to explode when uh, the water warmed up like it does every El Nino. And the, uh, uh, this is the extent of um, kelp before the problem. There's the extent of kelp after the problem. Two different spots. You can see the scale here. I mean, the kelp just disappeared because the sea urchins ran amok and the warm water reduced it anyway. And you're left with, that's a denuded. You know, normally there'd be a whole bunch of kelp growing on there. And this guy is just sucking up the sea urchins because you can't sell them. They're starving. Nobody wants to buy starving sea urchins. Um, so that's why you're managing your ecosystem. And that's why you need your research um, uh, platform to uh, set up a big computer model of what's going to be happening, depending on when these conditions occur, so that you can get ahead of that problem. And uh, so where I'm going is we need uh, a big computer model. And you have to have been at a wastewater treatment plant. But basically, we have a big television screen uh, that, that, and, and a computer model of how, what's supposed to be happening because we're growing bacteria to do all the treatment. And so how, how are we controlling the bacteria? And it's all up there and all the parameters. And you can see how many of this kind of bacteria and how many of that kind of bacteria. Oh, we need the same kind of thing for a reef. How many of this kind of fish? How many oh, the sea stars are starting to die? Um, or, or the sea urchins are getting to, be, well, getting to be too many of them. I guess we better either harvest or, hey, we could stock some lobsters to eat the sea urchins. Um, so you've you, you got to have a big computer model, which takes a big research thing to, to put together. So what I'm going to be suggesting uh, for the uh, ecosystem around the platform is you put the stakes in the sand bed and a whole bunch of sensors. So just, just remember that. That's, that's where we're going with this thing. Um, so you put the stakes in the sand bed with a whole bunch of sensors. Your sensors are detecting, um, might not do much. This is Grossolaria that's growing in the Gulf of Mexico, which we happen to have a nice photo of. Um, but you've got all these other critters growing. And um, you want to be sensing them. And that will allow you to put together the computer model. And you figure out what you're harvesting and what you're stocking. And, and you know, what's happening naturally. Um, so here's your platform. Uh, you have a whole bunch of sensors down here, cameras, uh, robotic fish, uh, acoustic, temperature maybe, uh, drone flying from the platform. And the reason you need the platform is because you want to wire everything back so you can watch all that's happening in real time and record the whole thing for, uh, so if you want to go look up what was going on during the week of uh, some week in 2017, um, it's all... It's all there. It's all got wired in, all that instrumentation. Gee, when did the temperature start increasing? Now, if you're looking at making money off this, uh, we're thinking it's way better than penned fin fish aquaculture on a dollar's perspective. And the reason is uh, you spend quite a bit on the structure, but hardly anything on the fertilizer, which is your food, instead of fish meal. Let's hear it for Mark. Thank you very much. 
So next we have Matt Sanders. He is with Pacific Ocean Energy Trust, uh, talking about uh, marine renewable technologies. So please join me in welcoming uh, Matt, Matt Sanders. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks to Greg and everyone here for having us today. Um, I'm happy to be here today to just kind of inform and, and teach you all a little bit about marine renewable energy. Um, we don't come necessarily with a specific proposal for a specific platform, but what we do see is opportunity to integrate marine renewable energy uh, opportunities and development around some of the existing infrastructure that's already out there based with the platforms. So uh, I think what I'll do is just kind of walk through a little bit about what marine energy is, the different types of it, and then we'll start seeing some pictures and talking about how different things work and the opportunities that uh, can come with them. So I do have a laser on here. Anyway, I think there is. Uh, marine hydrokinetic is essentially the, the motion of the ocean to uh, moving water to create electricity. So there's, there's different ways that we do that. Uh, you might hear me talk about the different ways throughout this presentation. First off is wave energy. This is something that literally it's the movement of waves, the up and down, the side to side, uh, moving some type of contraption to essentially create electricity through motion. Uh, you also have tidal energy. Tidal energy is the movement of water. It's, it's the tides. It's the coming in and the going out of tides. Highly predictable, uh, extremely energetic environment, rather challenging to work in. Uh, you also have ocean currents. So for example, the California current. Also, the, the Gulf Stream is the one that a lot of people know about. These are constant flows of, of water moving through areas. Highly energetic, um, massive amount of, of opportunity to, to develop electricity from these resources. And then you have something called ocean thermal exchange. Been in this business for about eight years. I still don't fully understand how it works, but it, it's, a, it's a gradient between warm water and cold water. It's something that typically focuses more in warm water environments. It might be something that Southern California could exploit, but typically we look at places like Hawaii and more equatorial locations for that. And then I'll talk a little bit about offshore wind today as well. Um, great resource off the coast of California and offshore wind. So most of my time is focused on wave energy. Here on the West Coast, we have an enormous wave resource, um, many million, thousands of miles of open ocean crashing against our shores, allow waves to, to gain strength and very few obstructions over that period to, to change that resource as it comes through. So I'll talk a little bit more about wave energy than those others today. Um, so as you see here, there's a tremendous resource, greater than 250 terawatt hours per year for the West Coast. That's more than we use in electricity, by the way. Um, obviously, exploiting all of that is not necessarily feasible, but it just shows that there's a massive amount of opportunity out there. It's an inexhaustible resource. It doesn't go away at night, where wind and solar have their variations um, very clearly. Uh, waves come through all the time. Highly predictable, as I mentioned earlier. This is a big one for utility planners. Uh, as you're integrating a whole lot of different renewable resources into your grid, uh, it, it's a challenge for utility planners to know how much sun you're going to have in three hours or in a week uh, as, you're, as you're trying to balance that with fossil fuel resources. Um, we can predict fairly accurately wave resources out to it from a week out uh, with little variation. So that really helps the planner distribute their uh, variation in resources. They're helping us keep our lights on every day. Uh, typically close to populations. A uh, good majority of the planet lives near a coast, so you don't need to move the power very far. Uh, I live in Portland, Oregon. Most of our generation is uh, created about 100 miles to the east of us at a, a coal plant out there. We do have a lot of hydro resource closer to town, but the coal plant is uh, over 100 miles east of Portland, and you're shipping that power over long distances, um, So, and you lose power the more you ship it, the further it goes. So it's nice to have your, your generation source close to, to where it's used. And then load matches closely to demand. So especially in Oregon, uh, it's, it's cold in the winter. Uh, it's dark in the winter. Um, we turn on our lights. We crank up our heat a lot more there in the winter. And in the winter season is when we have a higher power density of waves on the West Coast, as opposed to solar and wind. So it works pretty well. In theory, it could work pretty well, because it's not actually doing it right now. This is a map of Southern California. As you can see, anyway. Thinking there's a laser in here. Um, 
the, 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 the magenta area is the, is the stronger wave resource. That's where you're gonna get the best, uh, the strongest, biggest, most consistent waves over the course of a year. Um, as you come around point conception, you do lose quite a bit of the energy there. That's not to say there isn't still wave energy capability and possibility in this area. Um, but the, the platforms that are around point conception, the ones near Vandenberg, uh, do, do represent a better opportunity for uh, the offshore renewable development. Now I'll go through a few, just show you what some of these technologies look like, talk a little bit about how they work. This is a device, this is deployed at a, a test site in Hawaii, actually. Um, pretty simple, that large floating uh, thing on the left side of there just kind of bobs up and down, and that's spinning a, an internal turbine that is creating electricity, and then that power runs through a subsea cable back to shore. This is an oscillating water column device. Uh, essentially what's going on here, you can't see it all, but underneath that wave on the bottom right, the wave direction is, is crashing right into that, and it's compressing, and there's a large chamber underneath that device full of air, and the wave compresses the air through the chamber, up through that turbine looking thing there, and the air goes flying out, and then when the water recedes, when the air, when the, the wave recedes and the air comes back through, it pulls the air back in, essentially generating, you know, spinning that thing constantly as the waves come in and out. <coughs> this is a, another concept of a device um, called the, uh, the Columbia Power Technologies wave energy device. As you can see, the, the wave direction would be coming from the front of the slide towards the smaller hinge on the front there. Essentially, it's just two flapping arms that sit on the surface of the water. Uh, you know, something like this has a, a low surface profile, um, potentially has two generating systems on both sides. Uh, produces up to a megawatt's worth of power, this one at full scale would do. And something that's really neat about this is they've designed it with a single point mooring system. One of the concerns we've seen from the stakeholder communities, especially fishing community in Oregon, is entanglement options, fishing gear getting caught up as it moves. Um, so by reducing the amount of lines that you have going to the ocean, you're reducing the probability of something getting caught on it. So that's one of the things our organization has done over time is to work with all the different stakeholder groups to identify their concerns help connect them with the technology developers to hopefully create devices that minimize conflict over time. <clears throat> now I'm gonna shift towards offshore wind. <clears throat> offshore wind is uh, a, a massive opportunity for California. As you can see, um, the really dark colors are more focused towards northern part of the state, but there is still a fairly significant resource off the southern, especially down there near um, near the islands and near this area. And the reason that we're really exploring offshore wind in California now is because we've, we've shifted, the industry is shifting towards a floating technology as opposed to a foundational technology. So a lot of the offshore wind development that we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years um, from there, starting in the North Sea in Europe and there's uh, the first US project off of Rhode Island and now there's gigawatts in the pipeline for offshore wind on the East Coast. As you can see, it's a really strong resource over there too. Um, those are all typically in shallower waters. Once you get above 60 meters in depth, which we reach very quickly here in California, before you even get out to the stronger wind resource, then you need to have a floating technology. And now there's several uh, versions and, and devices and companies creating floating technologies with massive wind turbines on. We're talking things in the 12 to 15 megawatt range. Uh, so, you know, land-based land-based turbines that you're seeing are three on the high, you know, three to six on the high end. Uh, this is doubling that. You have a, you gain a lot by being offshore. You don't have to drive the turbines up roads, so you can you're you're not restricted on locations as much as you are. Um, you have very few uh, terrestrial obstructions. The winds are far more constant in California. It's also uh, very complementary to the duck curve. Anyone here who might know what the duck curve is? I'm not an expert on it, but essentially everyone comes home from work at five o'clock, like I was saying earlier, uh, cranks on their lights, turns up the heat. And that's also when the solar resource stops, starts dropping off. So it creates a, a massive demand for energy that is hard to meet with renewables at that time. Wind offshore California tends to pick up throughout the day and could help essentially flatten that line over time. California has very aggressive renewable energy targets, as you all know. Um, it's going to be hard to build more onshore wind. Solar has a long way to go. Uh, but even with the predictions that they're saying now, like. Once we energize our fleet, um, you know, the current energy demand is potentially able to be meet with current renewables. 
But as you start energizing the fleets and all sorts of different um, internet of things, everything we have is electrical, the, inter the electrical demands are continuing to rise. So it's, it's really important that we explore new opportunities. Offshore wind in California is certainly a massive opportunity. This is, uh, we'll go through kind of a bit of the, the technology here. Um, as you can see, I won't go through them all, but you go from land based to deep water. Uh, fairly straightforward there. Um, this is a scale picture uh, to show you how big these turbines are. So, that one on the right, that's the High Wind Pilot Project. That was uh, just commissioned in Scotland in 2017, <coughs> the first, world's first floating offshore wind project. They're pretty big, these are big devices. You can see there's 178 meters above the water and 80 meters below. And that's a technology that uh, has a very deep draft. They don't all go that deep. And that's actually restrictive on some levels on where they can deploy. This is a picture of the first, uh, the world, the US's first offshore wind farm, uh, Block Island project in, in Rhode Island. That's five, six megawatt turbines. Are those all turbines? Those five in the back there? <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Just the in the background there. Uh, I've talked a little bit about California. There's currently two unsolicited proposals for offshore wind projects. These are a bit north of here, obviously. Um, but uh, it shows the interest from the international development community. Um, there's a lot of people coming to California seeing a, a big opportunity for building offshore wind projects here. There's, there's some challenges uh, politically, environmentally. Uh, we're, we don't, we're not shying away from those. We're just working with industry to identify their priorities and then working with regulators and researchers to help address questions as we move down the road. First and foremost is we need to get lease areas uh, available for people to build projects. That's where BOEM comes in. Um, Doug downstairs and, and John have been working with us for years to help uh, identify these areas and work with industry. Uh, they fund a whole bunch of research into the environmental constraints and different things like that. So. Um, there's a lot going on in California. Uh, there's, a, there's a large constraint with the Department of Defense. Uh, there's a lot of testing and development that goes on with their operations in this area. So it presents a challenge for most development at this point, but that's something our organization focuses on, is, is working between industry and, and politics and trying to find ways forward. Here's a few pictures. This is the high wind project that, uh, that I've been talking about in Scotland. Very deep draft. This is a company called Principal Power. This, uh, this device was probably their one in Portugal. They had a pilot project out there that was in the water for about five years. This platform itself experienced 15 meter waves, um, continued to be operational throughout that period. Um, this platform, some of the technology in there is it shifts the ballast between the three different pillars to help stabilize it in different wave and wind configurations. You don't want your wind turbine swaying too much. It might break, but it's also just not as operational. Um, they're, they're designed to, to work straight up and down. So uh, they said even in those 15 meter waves, there is a matter of just a meter or two of movement from the tip of the device, tip of the turbine. Um, probably not doing enough justice to the environmental constraints of this, but this is just a, some of the things that we, we look at and, and have uh, studied, uh, continue to study, and will continue to study after we start seeing deployments uh, birds, whales, noise, uh, habitat changes, as you can read for yourself there. Um, go ahead. Uh, how, how is the energy transmitted? Thank you. Yeah. So subsea cables, uh, electrical cables. In our proposal, you know, we're here to say that we're not necessarily, I wouldn't propose putting one of those large wind turbines on an oil platform. From what I've been told, I'm not an engineer. They weren't designed for those types of shifting loads. But what you could do is you could build up projects around them, use the platform uh, for a substation type area. You will need <laughs> offshore substations. All the power from those different turbines needs to come together in one place. And then it goes out via cable from there. Um, and then the cables that are already built out to some of these platforms is an opportunity uh, either to reuse those cables. Some of them are reaching the end of their operational lives. But they're already laid. One of the, the another constraint in this is the environmental permitting and the costs and the time and the challenges of doing this. Uh, we we assume it would be easier to permit and lay new cable where there's already cable existing. 
um, if that was necessary. And if there's not electrical cables, some of these I know that there's, there's conduits, there's gas lines out there. So there's opportunity to even run new cables through some of the infrastructure that's already there. Let's hear it for Matt. And of course, Matt will be downstairs um, uh, to answer more questions as well. So uh, our next speaker will be from the Commercial Fisherman of, San, of Santa Barbara, Mike Nelson. After that, uh, Sarah Dearman from Chevron will be speaking. So please welcome Mike Nelson. Uh, thanks, Greg. But I want to particularly thank uh, your staff up top in the deck there, because they're going to shine a little light on my presentation. <laughs> Uh, because I'm standing in for uh, our executive director, Kim Selko, uh, who couldn't be here today. Uh, I have a special guest star. On the far end of the second row is a fellow named Chris Boss. He's the president of the Commercial Fishermen of Santa Barbara. And if you have a question after this is over about fishing around the rigs uh, or anywhere else in Santa Barbara Channel, he is the one that can answer those questions. Uh, the Commercial Fishermen of Santa Barbara have represented the fishing community in Santa Barbara for almost 50 years. The fishermen are the key, keystones of a seafood industry which boasts $13 million in dockside value and as much as $35 million in economic uh, <laughs> multiplier and spend. Um, it's a community um, of, of basically independent business people. Uh, they're not just fi fishermen, they oversee a low volume, high demand blue economy. It's characterized by resiliency. In fact, during the past four decades, the top fisheries have included 27 species. Santa Barbara's fishermen uh, have a continuing commitment to conservation and the, the health uh, of its fisheries in our ocean environment. It remains remarkably strong. Uh, particularly when you consider that they've had to sacrifice, by some estimates, 30% of its fishing grounds to allow the establishment of marine reserves, sanctuaries, protected areas. They've had to accommodate uh, gear-tight restrictions <laughs> to protect sensitive habitat and species, and now confronting climate change and downturns uh, such as domoic acid, uh, heat waves, and the warm blob. Um, when you ask the question, uh, have the rigs impacted our fisheries, the commercial fisheries in Santa Barbara? The answer is a resounding yes. No community has been affected by more off, by offshore oil production more than our fishermen. First, they've been literally forced to work around the massive footprints of the oil platforms for more than a half a century. To accept the loss of the several square miles of fishing ground and opportunity and to tolerate damages to their fishing gear. But like the establishment of mission reserves, we're also concerned that the plants, for the, the platforms that reduce fishing grounds, uh, they also contract, contract our operations to the point where it threatens the critical mass of the number of boats that we need uh, to have the viable, the viable port. Um, but despite these negative impacts, there have been some really positive benefits. Uh, our scientists at UCSB uh, have learned that the platforms have created reefs, highly productive nurseries for several types of rockfish. In fact, the studies have concluded, and I'll probably get this wrong, that the mean annual production of rockfish per square meter of seafloor around the platforms has been measured to be 27 times as much as is produced by a pair square by a per square foot or meter of natural reefs. How might the decommissioning impact our fisheries, our commercial fishing? Well, BOEM, as been mentioned before, the Bureau of Outdoor Out Ocean Environmental Management, and BESI, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental uh, Enforcement, uh, they require complete removal, complete removal, 15 feet below the mud line. But they may grant exceptions, and they can grant exceptions in certain conditions if certain conditions are met. The three decommissioning scenarios that are most often considered are three: removal, rigs to reef, and alternate use, alternative uses. 
Since our fishing community's livelihood is so directly affected by the ocean's health and its resources, we have comments and concerns about all three. First, complete removal, basically 15 below, feet below the mud line. If the rigs are fully removed, uh, we believe, we strongly believe that it's important to leave the seafloor at the site in a clean, uh, in a, a clean and free of any equipment, uh, muscle mounds, or toxins. Because obviously this is critical if the fishermen are going to reclaim this fishing ground and be allowed to harvest species from them again. Partial removal typically is at a is down a level. It's down to basically 80 to 80 feet down from where the platforms exist today. Our 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 consideration is that the rigs. If they're partially removed, it's better to leave the top deck in place uh, above the water line so that it's easier for the fishermen to, contin to continue to avoid the structures and see them. And it's also the best way to preserve the tremendous productive habitat that the reefs now provide. Uh, in fact, we've learned that 80% of the fish biomass and 86% of fish production would be retained if we pursue partial removal. So whether when the structure is cut off below the surface, it becomes a greater hazard. It's hard for a boat to track its position relative to a rig and make sure that the fishing gear doesn't get snagged in the structure. Essentially, the structures require twice as large a buffer radius around, around the rig, um, around the rig, which again doubles the amount of fishing grounds loss to the exploration of oil. Uh, moreover, buoys that have been attached to reefs in the past uh, have a history of coming loose and making it risk to risky to fish with nets. Uh, alternative uses. Uh, in this category, uh, we're talking about leaving the full jacket and the top deck intact in place for repurposing. The fishing community stands ready to benefit greatly <laughs> from opportunities to use one or more of these structures as anchors for new sustainable <coughs> shellfish operations and anchors for uh, ranching operations. This alternative would ensure highly visible structures remain on the surface and that the rigs continue to function uh, as nursery grounds and important fisheries habitats. For example, mussels and scallops can be harvest, harvested in the, the top 100 feet. We all know that mussels are some of the most sustainable and, and healthy sources of protein anyone could ever eat. Cages could be installed to grow and feed farmed abalone, a high value product that sometimes exceeds $90 per pound. Uh, urchins could be hung in cages um, th that could be fully farmed or gathered from natural reefs to be ranched or fattened up. Um, many of the reefs at Channel Island and the mainland coast are being overrun by purple, by purple urchins that inhibit the growth of kelp forest. Uh, ranching would provide an incentive for fishermen to remove the purple urchins and have the infrastructure to, to ranch these urchins, which could possibly be a win-win for the kelp forest and our fisheries. Our position. The rigs chosen for repurposing or partial decommissioning should be those that can quantifiably demonstrate the greatest net benefits to the marine environment and the local economy. We support a comprehensive process of evaluating the rigs uh, individually uh, for their maximum net benefit. The assessment must have accurate estimates of the long-term biological and economic impacts that relate to our fisheries. It's encouraging that a framework already exists for this type of analysis. We are aware that the Ocean Science Trust presented a methodology uh, years back that examined the marine resources, air emissions, socioeconomic impacts, ocean access, marine mammals, water quality, decommissioning costs, and avoided costs uh, to determine the viability of the decommissioning options. We also hope that whatever cost savings might occur if these options are pursued could be, will be deposited in the California Endowment of Marine Preservation and spent wisely to address the greatest concerns of our coastal com communities, such as sea level rise, adaptation, marine conservation, clean infrastructure, um, port infrastructure and fisheries enhancement. 
Since the State Lands Commission has recently initiated the abandonment and decommission of Platform Holly, it represents an immediate opportunity for stakeholders to engage and support repurposing or a partial removal, particularly, particularly because it's owned by the State of California and not a private entity. I mention this because existing state law, the Marine Resources Legacy Act, while it may represent a good start, a great beginning, it may not adequately address some basic issues such as continuing liability, which the oil companies have raised. And if these issues aren't addressed, it may prevent these owners, these companies, from giving real consideration to voluntarily apply to partially remove or pursue an alternative use. Couple these statutory weaknesses with the, influence, with the influence that we know organizations that are raising money to defeat any proposal that requires a, any, any structure be left in place. Uh, we think the only way to support repur repurposing uh, of a reef for another use is if the stakeholders in this room uh, actively work to address the existing law's shortcomings. Thank you very much, and we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, yes, sir. Are there compatibility issues between uh, repurposing for, for your purpose and uh, the energy uh, people that we just heard from? Well, and, and no, not in all cases. Um, uh, because one of the situations that you have as we speak today is the habitat that these platforms has created is there. And the existing requirement by the law, federal and state law, is that that goes. Everything goes. And that includes the habitat that's been created. We like to think there's a way that we can, re we can work with these alternative uses uh, and also build on this successful habitat. Um, <coughs> so we think it can be worked out. But first, We've got to have the owners of those 23, those 23 rigs apply for a partial decommissioning. It's not a choice that we get to make. It's not a, a, a choice that the, uh, fed, the federal agencies I mentioned get to make. Uh, it's, we've, got to, we've, got to, we've got to have a relationship with the owners uh, to, to support this sort, of, this sort of use. Can we have a real quick one more question yep. here? Yeah, I, I would, my question was similar to that. Whether okay. Whether you could have multiple forms of yeah. uses we, we, the platform, but also given the extreme cost of removal, uh, the possibility of, of setting up some kind of a trust to deal with, you know, issues to indemnify the oil companies to give yeah, them. That's the what the existing law, the good start I talked about, tried to do. It established just that account. So the savings would be split between the state as well as the, the company. Um, and the idea is that money would be available for these sorts of projects and coastal and issues along the coast. But that's okay. from Mike. That's great. Awesome. Thank you. So our final, final speaker today is Sarah Dearman. She is with Chevron, and Chevron is one of our sponsors, along with Scott Newhall today, and we also got some support from ExxonMobil, so thank you again to them. At uh, 4 o'clock, uh, we will be uh, meeting, uh, doing a little very short presentation downstairs on the main floor of the museum uh, with George Steinbach, who uh, was the kind of came up with the idea of doing this expo here today. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Dearman. <laughs> Uh, my name is Sarah Dearman. I'm the Public Affairs Representative for Chevron's West Coast Decommissioning Program. I've been with Chevron for about 15 years. I joined this particular program about a year ago, and we opened our office here um, on State Street in Santa Barbara in January. So our decommissioning program is exactly what it says. We are here to decommission some of the platforms that we have the liability for offshore Santa Barbara County. Um, we, Chevron and other companies that we've since merged with or required, put in these platforms between the 60s and the 80s. Um, we sold our interest in these platforms in the 1990s to some other companies, including Venico and what is now Freeport McMoran Oil and Gas. 
Um, when we sold them in the 90s, we did retain the liability for decommissioning, so understood that at some point these assets would essentially boomerang back to us to decommission. Uh, the 2015 Plains All-American pipeline spill did speed that up a bit. Um, we had been keeping our eye on the Point Aguayo platforms, thinking those would come back to us first, but when Plains All-American um, happened and Venico no longer had a way to, to um, transport the oil that they had produced from these platforms, they went bankrupt and we came back to decommission the Gale and Grace platforms. At the same time, Freeport McMoran, again, because of the economic viability was no longer there, decided that they were gonna work towards decommissioning the Point Aguayo unit platforms, Hidalgo, Harvest, and Hermosa. Uh, so we are working with them on doing that. We have shared interest in decommissioning those platforms. They are doing the plugging and abandoning. We'll come back and be financially responsible for the actual decommissioning. So just to give you a little bit of an idea about the scale of these platforms that we're working with and some of the uh, challenges that we're facing doing the decommissioning here in the Pacific. So we've removed some platforms here in the state waters, which are about 120 feet of water depth. The world record for full removal is 500 feet, and some of the platforms that we're working with are 739 feet. That's just the water depth. When you take into account the top side, it's a little bit over 1,000 feet, similar to the Empire State Building. So we're looking at really large structures, the bottom of which are about the size of two football fields, and as they get deeper, get exponentially heavier. Um, although we do this decommissioning work quite often, and especially through a company, our internal company called the Environmental Management Company, which does approximately 2,300 decommissioning jobs per year worldwide, offshore and onshore. Decommissioning in federal waters off the coast of California has never been done before. So we're working very closely with the regulatory agencies to understand the process here, what's gonna be similar to what we're doing in Gulf of Mexico, what's gonna be different, um, how we can help support the environmental studies that they're doing for the NEPA process. <coughs> Um, in addition to that, when we do decommissioning in the Gulf of Mexico, the equipment is readily available. It's all in Gulf of Mexico. We can bring out the heavy lift barges. Some of the actual physical material that's needed to do the decommissioning on the platform is already there. That infrastructure doesn't exist here in California. So as we've been doing the decommissioning work, we've had to look worldwide to bring in some of the resources that would otherwise not be an issue to have at our fingertips. So we've been looking um, at bringing things up from the Gulf of Mexico, from the North Sea, um, from Asia, but trying to understand how to get those resources out here. In addition, as we've come back to do the decommissioning, because we haven't operated these platforms for 20 something years, uh, we've also had to do a lot of work to get the platforms up to our safety standards in order to then decommission them. So it, it seems to be, you know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but we've been working very, very hard to make sure that everything is at our safety, safety standards to continue the decommissioning work. So as I mentioned, we've got a couple different projects over our entire program. The first is Santa Clara. Uh, that is two platforms off the coast of Carpinteria, as well as the car onshore Carpinteria processing plant. So we inherited the platforms back through the Venico bankruptcy, but chose to repurchase the plant so we could take care of our decommissioning obligations with that as well, and use it for the decommissioning of the actual pipelines. So right now we are currently plugging and abandoning wells on Grace, soon to move over to Gale, and then uh, once that's completed, we'll begin the decommissioning work on the onshore plant. As you can see again, these are in very deep water. Um, and weigh quite a bit. With Gale, 30,000 tons, just to give you an idea of perspective, the average car weighs 1.4 tons. So it's about the size of 21,000 cars to be able um, to take it out of the water. Our other project is Point of Gale. Uh, this is the one that we're working on with Freeport MacMahon. So Freeport is currently doing the plugging and abandoning of the wells, similar to what we're doing at Santa Clara. Once that's done, we'll come in to complete the decommissioning process. Again, you can see these are extremely large structures. 
In addition to the platforms, we'll also be working on the decommissioning of the onshore gaviota plant. So um, since platforms are the topic of the day, I thought I'd just give everyone kind of a general idea of what they look like under the water. A lot of times um, you'll hear platforms used interchangeably with the word rigs. So the rigs are actually just those two towers on the far right hand side. That's all the rig is. The rest of it is the actual platform. So what you see from shore is called the top side. So you've got the rig on there, uh, the modules, which house the living quarters for the employees that are on there right now doing the decommissioning work. But when it was operating, they would live um, on there to actually do a rotational, usually a 14 day on, 14 day off, to work the operations of the rigs. The deck is what holds that whole top side up. So that's the part just above the water line that keeps that housed. Underneath the water, and this is what you'll hear referred to a lot with the rigs to reef piece of it, is the jacket. So the jacket is the really large structure under the water that houses the wells, as well as some of the pipeline that then transports the oil or transported the oil back onto shore. As we look at the decommissioning process, right now we're in the well abandonment phase, so making sure that the wells are plugged, abandoned, um, that we won't have any issues with that and they will no longer be producing going forward. After those are abandoned, we'll move to the pipeline abandonment. So once the wells are flushed, we can flush out the pipelines and essentially abandon those, um, which will then lead us to be able to decommission the onshore facilities. After that piece is done, we'll look at removing the top sides, followed by um, the removal of the jacket if it was to be a full decommissioning process. Once those are done, then a big piece of our puzzle is the transportation, processing, and recycling of all that removed material. So again, Gulf of Mexico, there's facilities there that can handle this amount of steel, and it's something that is a fairly turnkey process. Here in California, again, those facilities don't exist. So that's been a big part of our scope is to understand, again, looking at India, Turkey, Mexico, uh, Europe, places that will be able to, to, um, to take this amount of steel and be able to process it. <coughs> so these are all things that we're working on right now, trying to understand what the scope will look like go forward, going forward. But this is the general decommissioning process and the different parts that, um, that will have to be dealt with as that process goes on. That's her for Sarah Beerman. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank our sponsors today. We could not do this without our sponsors. I want to thank Chevron and Scott Newhall, both of our, our main sponsors. Thank you very much to them. We also uh, received um, marketing and printing support from ExxonMobil, so thank you very much to them. Did you all enjoy the presentations up in the theater? Oh, good. Good. I want to thank all of our presenters and vendors. We uh, obviously couldn't do this without them, so let's hear it for them as well. So when we planned this quite a few months ago, the original idea was to have a keynote speaker at 4 o'clock who would be sort of an expert in all the different opportunities out there for the oil platforms. We don't think that person exists. Uh, we didn't find that person. So the next thing we looked at was uh, representatives from state or federal agencies who could provide an overview of the process of the decommissioning uh, at, a, at a higher level. And uh, understandably, uh, the people that we reached out to were reluctant to be here uh, due to certain projects that were uh, being prepared and that they would have to review or for just travel reasons or other things. So, uh, so uh, although not our first choice, we are very happy to have, uh, and he knows it, uh, but, but it also was his idea to do this expo. Uh, and so we couldn't have done this without uh, George Steinbach. Uh, George also, uh, we were hoping to have some volunteers here today, but they, uh, we had some technical difficulties. But uh, quite a few, uh, almost a year ago at least now, George got us these uh, virtual reality goggles. So uh, on certain weekend days here at the Maritime Museum, you could put those on and, and be out, uh, diving one of the oil platforms. 
in, three, in virtual reality, which is just like you are out there, except you're not as cold and not as wet. Uh, so George has been very good to us uh, by pr providing those for us. George Steinbach has served as the executive director for the nonprofit California Artificial Reef Enhancement Program and previously worked for Chevron Corporation, where he was a division manager for Chevron's California offshore operations. He received a bachelor's degree from the United States Military Academy at West Point and a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering uh, from the University of Texas at Austin. So please uh, join me in welcoming George Steinbach. Yes, I'm in second place. But I told Greg I'm fine with that. I'm just glad to be on the team. <clears throat> well, welcome to today's exhibit or expo on alternative uses. I think this is the first of its kind that I know of, uh, certainly in California and maybe, maybe even beyond. <clears throat> You've seen something new today, and who knows, maybe perhaps we can do this again next year with an update from all of these vendors on what they've been able to accomplish in a year and maybe even some new ideas. First, I'd like to thank Greg and the museum themselves for hosting this event. I think this demonstrates their commitment to the community of Santa Barbara and providing both useful and balanced information that, and education for the, for the general public on marine issues. I would also like to thank the exhibitors for coming. Uh, it takes time and effort, which are valuable commodities to you, I know. But it's important for people to understand what you are doing. Uh, you, oh, excuse me. You represent the creativity and in ingenuity that keeps our country strong and prosperous. Please keep up the good work. And finally, I want to thank all of you for coming and showing an interest in an important subject that I think will be soon in the public spotlight. I am sure most of you have already already realized this, but the decommissioning process for the offshore oil and gas platforms in California has already begun. In the Santa Barbara Channel, there are now 12 offshore platforms which are currently shut in, and this represents almost half of the total number of platforms in the whole state. <clears throat> Operators for six of these platforms have indicated that they will not be restarting production. And it's my belief, certainly, that, the, not, that these numbers will grow over the next few years. Um, this is all happening, of course, because the business cycle for this industry uh, winds down and reaches what is really a natural and final conclusion. You've probably heard about Platform Holly. <laughs> Uh, it's not very far from here at all, which has been the subject of public hearings um, put, presented by the State Lands Commission. And at these hearings, there's, uh, it's interesting to see some of the to how the topics are discussed, but so, there's some very important topics which um, uh, really are not controversial and are not debated in any significant way. One of these is a, is a common thread that runs through all, all of these decommissioning processes. Um, because regardless of the outcome of a particular project, three things are going to happen. Uh, first is the cessation of oil and gas production. Second is the removal of all the oil and gas facilities offshore. And the third is the capping of all the wells. And this is certainly good news, uh, especially for the environment, where we now can reduce the risk for spills and leaks and accidents of all sorts to virtually zero. At these same meetings, there are other discussions uh, which are generating a lot more debate. And I think this is going to accelerate. Because after you do those three things, what you have to do is deal with the structure itself. Um, now they're, they're essentially steel frameworks, as you know. They're, they consist of legs and cross beams and cross members and various things in a lattice-like structure uh, and that were simply designed to do one thing, and that was to hold everything up out of the water. They have provided a stable platform, in some cases in very deep water, and have stood up the test of time, both winds, waves, and storms 
over a period of uh, 30 to 40 years in some cases. Uh, we often forget that they were, in their time, engineering marvels. They were some of the first projects in what was then a new frontier, the depths of the Pacific Ocean. First just off the coastline, and then later in much deeper water as they moved beyond the continental shelf. And they were well done, they were well designed. They have an excellent record, and have provided a safe place for the men and women of the oil industry to both live and work offshore. In many cases, or actually in most cases, these structures have many years of useful lives remaining, so, assuming they're properly maintained. So the question will be whether or not they should be reused uh, for some other purpose. It is a given that once they are removed, these types of structures will never be built again. Um, our environmental regulations require that all reasonable alternatives be examined and it is possible that some of the ideas that you've seen presented at the exhibit at the expo today will um, actually be proposed and reviewed. Now, these structures are each unique in their in several ways. They're unique in their design, their location, and their water depth. Uh, and, and I think it would be a mistake to treat them all in, 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 with one big broad brush. And many experts that I have uh, talked to and which I trust uh, have described this, the, eventual out, the optimal eventual outcomes for these platforms to be in several different categories. There are obviously some of these platforms which I think are candidates for full removal. There are other platforms which are candidates for a partial removal, where you can retain the underwater portions as artificial reefs for the marine, marine life that exists there. And then there's another set of platforms which are potentially available and potentially useful for uh, other alternate uses like we've seen here today that would be uh, especially or significantly beneficial to either the economy or to um, the general public at large. And you've seen some of those exhibits, particularly I would highlight the, the alternate energy production, the wind and wave uh, uh, projects, and the mariculture projects, both mariculture, commercial mariculture, which we've seen examples of here, as well as mariculture for habitat restoration. I think both of those could be very, very beneficial. Um, I think this expo is a good starting point uh, for a discussion of this, and most people agree that this discussion is very, very much worth having. Um, and uh, that's, where we, that's where we stand as far as um, the exhibit. Our, object our objectives are really to let you see some of these alternatives um, without advocating for any one or the other. This is a process of, of being, uh, of in both informing the public and educating the public about these alternatives. Thank you, George. Thank you to all of you for being here today. This is, as George mentioned, the start of the conversation. Uh, we hope to continue this conversation here at the Maritime Museum. I'm sure other places will as well. If you're not on our mailing list, there's an opportunity at the table right up front to be on our mailing list. And of course, we would love to have you as members of the Maritime Museum, and there's information about that as well. Thank you for being here today. Thank you again to our vendors. Thanks to our sponsors. And safe home. It's a little wet out there. Thankfully, it's wet. So thank you, everybody.